Snow Crash was a sci-fi written by Neil Stevenson. The book was written in 1991. That was pretty early on, and back then there was probably not much internet going on. In the book, Neil Stevenson described a world that the hero lives in the, a physical world. He's a pizza delivery guy, but in the night. He logged into a virtual world called Metaverse, and he become a hero. We, as a human being, spend more and more time in the virtual world. The whole human race is moving from the physical world slowly into the virtual world, with the help, of course, blockchain and cryptocurrency. This is something that、uh, you probably cannot stop. In 2018, the word blockchain became synonymous with technological progress. If the promises of its pioneers are fulfilled, this new technology will transform every aspect of our lives, from the money we use to the food we eat to the way we govern ourselves. For the first time in history, the trust required for human interaction might be replaced. By the code of a machine. Since two years' time now, we are traveling as the Bitcoin family, and I'm known as the guy that went all in in Bitcoin. And since then, we've been traveling all over the world. Now driving to Oslo. Ancient Rome. The Bitcoin family goes Euro. We should be there in like two minutes. We arrived in Rovereto, Italy. They also call it Bitcoin Valley. It's only going up. <laughs> And then. The media started following us in, in Asia as well, and they were like, "Oh, we want to film something with you from." Then they came from Bangkok, and then they came from Germany. So we realized, okay, maybe we shall. We need to accept this role as a Bitcoin family and just use it、um, to help other people. Thanks so much. Give a warm welcome for you. Wow, this is exciting <laughs> in Portugal. So many people. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I had a father from Indonesia. I had a mother from Holland.、Um, I'm from the year 78, so my daughters think I'm old. <laughs> Speaking about my daughters, let's get them on stage. It's very important to have them. I know they all look like my daughters, but this is really my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want them on stage because I want to show my respect to my family. Because without those guys, I would never have been able to take all the steps we took. I grew up to be a very materialistic guy and work and make a lot of money. And I was thought that would make you happy. And I thought I would be a happy guy if I would reach those goals of becoming a millionaire and all those things. And at the end, it was the dying of my parents that woke me up. At that point, I was 24 years old, and I was having dinner with my family, as we always did on Wednesday. At the end of this dinner, I told、uh, I told my mother,、oh, "Mom, love you. See you tomorrow." Went home, went to bed, and at two o'clock in the night, my brother called me, and it was Didi, Didi. Said, "Yeah, yeah, man, I'm sleeping." Didi, mom, stop breathing. I got up, raced to my father's and mother's house. She was on the floor in the kitchen. I went to there and. And, and they were rehabilitating her, and then she got in coma seven days. And seven days later, she died. She was 48 years old. 
She always used to say to me, Didi, you need to dare to live life. Many years later, the same thing happened with my father. He died at 61. You get confronted with the fact that life is way more precious than all that materialism. And then I went to my wife and asked her, let's sell just everything, the house, the cars, and then go all in. Man, what kind of life have we been living? We started opening our garage box and there were like six bikes we didn't use for years and televisions and all kind of stuff we just bought, bought, bought and made us feel sick. It made us feel really sick. And at that point she said, Didi, uh, we are doing the right stuff. Let's sell it. You are right. We are going to sell everything. And it was all turned into bitcoins. So yeah, everything I had turned virtual. <laughs> You could see it as a futuristic way of living. In the future, I think the world will have changed so much that people don't even have the need of having stuff anymore. They won't be owning a car. Because a lot of people get born and born and born, so that the world is getting overpopulated, there will be a time when nobody has a place anymore to hide their stuff. So they need to own less and less in the future. So I think in 20 years time, we don't own anything anymore. Everything will be a product on the blockchain. The rapid growth of cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin brought economic freedom and huge prosperity to a small number of people in an incredibly short period of time. Overnight, the lives of early adopters were transformed. Now, some of the pioneers are dreaming of using their vast crypto fortunes to reshape the world around them. So a couple hundred years ago, it would seem almost inconceivable that church and state should be two separate things, because back then the church was the state. And today it sounds a bit wild to say that we should separate money and state, but that's starting to happen right before our eyes thanks to the invention of cryptocurrency. And the next step will be to separate society from state. Today we have a few small groups of people living in you know, capitals like Beijing or Washington, D.C., or places like that, they claim that they have the moral right to tell people what they're allowed to buy and sell and who they can send and receive money with. But the more economics I studied, the more I realized that government intervention in the economy and government restricting trade of individuals, that's retarding and limiting the rate of economic growth of the world. They're holding back the entire world from being as good of a place as it otherwise could have been. That's you know, almost brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it because even if they're just retarding the rate of economic growth by just half a percent per year, when you compound that year after year, decade after decade, century after century, we would already maybe be traveling the stars at this point. Now we have the ability to say no. People that don't want to participate in the existing systems have a tool to opt out. The future I'm trying to build is one in which each individual has complete control of their own lives and their own finances. And we're using technology to build those tools rather than traditional voting and political activism, which we've seen over the last you know, 100 plus years. Those aren't effective tools. Bitcoin Cash friend of mine started working on a project called Free Society that basically is the idea of, uh, well, we have all these economic resources available to us now. Let's approach an existing government somewhere in the world and get them to sell us a swath of land and not just sell us the land, but grant us sovereignty with that land, at which point we'll set up the world's very first non-country. I imagine things will be uh, a lot more fun than uh, other places where you have small groups of people bossing everybody around, telling them what they can or can't do, or making them get permission for this, or pay money to do that. And at the end of the day, the market will find a way to do those things, and they'll find a way to do it better, faster, cheaper, more reliably than the governments have been able to do it. We think we can raise several billion dollars uh, from our own money, plus money from the public. I think a lot of these digital nomads from around the world will love to move to a place like this where they'll, they'll be free to, to explore their creative possibilities and, and do their thing. And I'm looking forward to being around people like that. Technology is uh, a power that we use to like, rearrange matter in the world. And technology can't engineer human freedom. As fundamentally, as up to human beings to like, actualize, like, potentialize themselves. But technology, what it does do is it enlarge some area of human activity. There's this thing called crypto, or, or for example, projects like Bitcoin. And they've 
you know, they grew up out of nowhere, and some of the people got carried along for the ride and found themselves now at the tops of these projects. But when we really look at the things in terms of like global politics and finance, it's insignificant. I want people to have a little bit, a tiny bit of perspective instead of, instead of thinking about how they can carve out a piece of turf for themselves now, here, think about what's possible. So that means building a narrative. What is our narrative? What is our analysis of state, of civilization, of financial system? What is the role of the technologies that we want to build? Uh, when I was younger, I used to train a lot in martial arts. I was also a mathematician, uh, artist. I got into cryptocurrency. I developed LibBitcoin, the first alternative implementation of Bitcoin. Also, I surfed on the front line fighting against ISIS. My interest in history, in politics, in many different areas, all kind of starting to come together in a related way on what is my purpose or role as my ability to be able to organize. The problem is not an economic problem that we're facing. Society is fundamentally overwhelmed with this massive feeling of disempowerment, of nihilism, of selfishness, of uh, alienation. The way that we look at the world is fundamentally empirical, but the actual reality that we live in is complex. There's like many different things going on. And the danger is that when you reduce reality to solely what you can measure and you can repeat in a scientific experiment, you leave out a whole other domain of like human knowledge, of human understanding. The environment around us is not static. The world is in a continuous process of change. And therefore, we have to have a historical perspective, which informs us where we are now and where we're heading towards. But it's also a moment of opportunity. But only if we can organize and prepare ourselves to be able to seize on that moment. Because if it's not us, it will be another group that fills that power vacuum. Blockchain technology is a broad set of technologies to enable strangers to interact with each other. And blockchain is essentially just like, how do you get a group of strangers together and enable them to keep track of what, what each other are doing and sort of interact with each other without a central party? Cryptocurrencies were the first application of blockchain but newer generations of the technology have allowed different types of value to be transacted, creating the possibility of social interaction on a global scale. The political possibilities of this new technology are now being experimented with. We are here in Shanghai. We are having a conference. Today, Yongbang State is going to announce they are going to uh, start a jurisdiction for digital economy. This is a history of history. Liu Zhanbin, the Yongbang Special Economic Zone is inside the Shan State in Burma. The piece of land we have, which is 220 square kilometers, is next to China's border. We want to create the world's first digital economy experiment with 40 million people who are dirt poor. So I think, okay, we are blockchain people, right? We are trying to use a new way. And what is our way out? And I think the way out is about develop economy. That Inge 
，也是在缅北地区，呃，也是唯一的一个地方，在克钦邦，这也是我们下一步的一个特区的目标之一。那全世界最大的稀土稀矿也是在缅北，目前都是在，但还没有被开发的。They are so poor because the Burmese government、uh, don't give them ID card. They are landlocked. They cannot go anywhere because they don't have a passport. So we can issue everybody a digital ID use blockchain. 那么，那我们的一个社会尝试是，我们准备在永邦做一个政府，但是没有公务员的政府。如果你用人去干活的话，人会犯错误，就犯那种技术错误，他就。呃，很愚蠢，然后一直犯错，对吧？这个也让大家呃觉得没有效率。那我们永邦要做一个数字经济的政府，应该是什么呢？第一个呢，我们要有呃，我们发了一个叫永邦币，这是一个人类的一次社会实践。如果你在一个已经有法律程序啊、呃，有法律框架，有许多。条条框框的时候，你很难去改变世界，是吧？你很难去做一个实验，因为呃，如果你实验不成功的话，大家都要倒霉，是吧 ？I don't think Burmese government aware that some state has given a piece of a small piece of place to、uh, us to do the digital economy. No, I'm I'm very interested. To have a conversation with them, if I can, to say, okay,、uh, can we work together? Burma today is become a competition place between U.S. and China, so we don't want to see them become a proxy war place. And then, if we can have a digital economy that is open to the world, right? So, if you have one Yongbang coin. You can be a Yongbang citizen. So I don't care if you are American citizen at the same time or a Chinese citizen. So by opening to the world, maybe we can avoid them become a proxy war potential. So one of the things people are talking about in crypto spaces right now is what they call like governance. You can build a quote-unquote decentralized technological system, but how do you build an authentic decentralized governance system such that it would distribute the actual like political influence、um, more evenly? I guess that's the kind of, one of the frontiers of like actually making these systems authentically decentralized. Blockchain's ability to create networks without any need for a central authority has led academics to consider how this technology. Might be used to develop entirely new self-regulating societies. The problem of having large nation states is that the way in which political decision making is made through a very small number of individuals in a, a very centralized and top-down way, it doesn't really reflect the complexity itself of a human society. There is no way in which the top of the hierarchy can have full, perfect information of everything that is going on in the lower parts of the system to make the best decision. Whereas nature does this very beautiful thing of organizing itself without the need of any central control, yet nature is the most complex and organized system that exists. So for the last ten years, I was looking into what types of systems of decision making or governance could help us have a similar way of organizing our societies in the way nature does it. Seasteading consists on creating floating human communities on the ocean that are politically autonomous. Companies like the Seasteading Institute are trying to build these floating startup societies. So let's imagine a scenario where none of these floating cities has a centralized government that is permanent. How do we deal with problems of property registration? How do we make sure 
that the individuals we are doing business with actually exist. All this type of information can exist on a distributed ledger without the need of any central government or organization controlling it. Santa Cruz del Islote is an island in the north coast of Colombia. It's an Afro community that has been isolated for hundreds of years. I want to understand what can we learn from this self-organized community. 318 años de fundado tiene el islote. Si no en forma de pesca. Como en esta isla no había ejen ni mosquito, ellos se situaron acá. Acá nosotros acá no tenemos paramilitarismo, no tenemos guerrilla, no tenemos delincuencia común, no tenemos policía acá. Buenas, buenas. Entonces acá la tranquilidad es única. Y como para llamar la atención, vamos para la isla más poblada del mundo. Hay 1.200 habitantes en una hectárea de, de terreno y en ocupando el segundo lugar. Nosotros vivimos cerquita. Si tú miras, vivimos cerca. Nos damos cuenta cuando el vecino tiene problemas. Y ahí es que somos bastante unidos. El problema del vecino ayuda a solucionar. Nadie se nos acuesta con hambre. Si, si viene una, una barca con pescado, regálame una liga, coge tu pescado. Yo le pido a Dios que mi comunidad nunca cambie, porque yo me siento muy orgullosa de mi comunidad, de ser negra y de ser mujer en esta comunidad. La isla es de la gente que vive en la isla y por ende eh, le da un estatus de que esto es mío y debo cuidarlo. Pero el problema es que la política pública de, de, de nivel Estado colombiano y otras comunidades se centraliza, se centraliza y todo el poder de decisión se toma allá en, en Bogotá o se toma en ciudades capitales importantes y las comunidades apartadas realmente no sienten que, que, que están respaldados por un país o, o, o unas leyes o unos programas. ¿Cómo se toman las decisiones aquí en la isla? Sí, la máxima autoridad de la comunidad es el Consejo Comunitario. Entonces el Consejo Comunitario lo forma toda la comunidad, que es la Asamblea. Primero la Asamblea, después los dignatarios, Después vienen los demás que territorios comunales. Okay. ¿Por qué? Porque los dueños de territorio son el Consejo Comunitario. Entonces, básicamente, queremos crear islas artificiales con sus propias regulaciones. ¿Qué consejo tú, que tienes aquí viviendo 60 años, puedes darnos a nosotros? Bueno, la forma en que, no sé en qué forma van, van a querer hacer esas islas artificiales. No sé si será por... por por algún medio tecnológico, no sé cómo. Lo primero es trabajar, trabajar con la comunidad y que, y que no haya un malentendido entre nosotros y creamos un ambiente feliz, como cualquier hogar en la casa donde, donde el jefe sea el, puede ser el, el papá, pero que todos tengan el mismo mando, la misma voz y la que, que todos tengan el mismo, la misma voz en la casa. Que todas las personas puedan participar. Participar, en las decisiones. exactamente. Y la decidir, no solo participar. Es decir, para participar en, en todo. La, la, en el, así como en el hogar, transparencia, cuando se trata de, de comunidad. Sí. sí. Cuando viene, bueno. What struck me the most about coming to Santa Cruz del Islote is to see that this community has managed to found the ideal mix between individual input in decision making and the collective output. It's a relatively small community, so people know that every decision that they make is going to affect them all. I think it's possible to use blockchain technologies to scale up this model so it works not just for a few hundred people, but for a few thousand. And this is something that blockchain does very well with the central notion of decentralized consensus. In the same way that a small community regulates the behavior of its population, 
through unspoken rules and boundaries. The common ledger of the blockchain maintains its integrity using something called a consensus mechanism. This is an algorithm or a set of rules that allocates responsibility and authority to its participants in order to maintain an accurate public ledger. Governance on the blockchain has the potential to offer a new set of social parameters on how we interact with one another. No longer will we need to trust each other in the machine-ordered universe. Pienso en algunas discusiones que da el arte en relación a la tecnología y digo, bueno, si esta tecnología permite habitar mejor el mundo, bueno, prefiero esa tecnocracia, ¿no? Pero de vuelta, ¿quién gobierna esa tecnología? ¿Cómo es esa discusión? En los algoritmos también hay política. ¿Quién creó ese algoritmo? <risa> ¿Ok? ¿Quién crea los algoritmos que, que nos dan supuestamente token? ¿no? Es, y esto para mí es como un, un eje eh, central para entender si queremos cambiar el sistema o, o no, o nos queremos hacer los onzos con el sistema. ¿no? The algorithms driving the latest blockchains allow much more than just tokens to be exchanged. For example, the Ethereum blockchain allows so-called smart contracts to be executed between different parties, allowing human interaction to be mediated solely by the code of a machine. Most computer programmers in the world, they have a job, nine to five, they go in an office, they have a crappy cubicle, they don't have much of a review, they have a manager who bothers with TPS reports or whatever. And suddenly, you know, it's like, Programmers sort of all over the world can become the new lawyers, can become the new architects of the social systems, of the economic systems. The software that we make is going to be software that underpins the foundations of society. It's the imagination of people who can come up with procedures, with uh, formal algorithms, forms to create games of interaction between people and allow computers to replace much of the workings of, of the legal system. And when you've got the algorithm running things, then you're into a whole, a whole new world, a whole new model. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's a brave new world. It's, it's, it's very different. Um, and whether it's, you know, I, I, I hesitate to say that it's a better world. I'm not sure that um, these things can be objectified in such a way, but it's certainly a different world. And it's, I would dare say, probably more economically efficient. If we imagine the blockchain as a virtual world, then algorithms are the legal system which allow everything to function. They are the framework which specify how a common consensus on all interactions is agreed upon and ensure the accuracy of the ledger is maintained. Depending on how their creators design them, different blockchains use different mechanisms to create this consensus. Bitcoin uses something called proof of work, which uses large amounts of computing power to verify its ledger in a process commonly known as mining. Newer blockchains, such as Ethereum, use different concepts to achieve consensus, often combining complex forms of mathematical encryption. Some of the first people to start using blockchain for purposes other than cryptocurrency are scientists with bold visions for the future. Hello, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to be, to be back here with Sophia once again and with Sophia's brother, who we usually keep locked in, in the basement back in Hong Kong. He doesn't, he, do, he doesn't get out that much. Now, Sophia, we're going to show them how you can recognize some of the emotions on my face. So what emotion am I showing now? Let me see. You look happy. All right. Let's try. How about now? Let me see. You look angry. All right. How about, okay, one more. You look surprised. All right. So, of course, I'm, I'm giving pretty extreme facial expressions there, which isn't always how things come up in. If you create kind, okay. compassionate, so, loving AIs and robots, then this can help 
you know, to transform the world into a, a kind and loving place. And if you're going to get a technological singularity in which AIs become much smarter and more capable than people, well, that's going to be a lot better if it's done with love and compassion. What direction are you looking? I'm looking to the left. In the current situation, AI is increasingly controlled by an, an oligopoly of a small number of tech companies and militaries. But we would rather open it up so the AI is controlled by the AI developers and users and the AIs themselves. The basic thing we're looking to do here is create a decentralized AI ecosystem wherein... So SingularityNet is a blockchain-based platform and marketplace for AIs. So anyone who develops an AI can put it into the SingularityNet platform and then anyone who needs AI services calls into the AIs on the SingularityNet to get what they want. But then as well, the AIs in the SingularityNet can talk to each other. And then all the AIs in this decentralized network are learning from each other and talking to each other. The data that comes to these robots' eyes goes into the singularity net decentralized network. And the, what you say to the robot coming in through their, through their microphones goes into the decentralized network. It was the advent of Ethereum with the, the Solidity language for scripting smart contracts that really woke up to me like, wow, these ideas that I've been thinking about forever, we now have an easy to use tool set that, that, that lets us realize this. And I think it will be best for the world and for the creation of a positive technological singularity if AI comes into the world in a way that's you know, organic, self-organizing and democratically controlled rather, rather than a way that is controlled you know, by a a commercial company with a very specific vertical market focus, or worse yet, by the military. We launched the alpha version of the platform in December of last year. The beta version will finally be launched in February of 2019. And I think then we're going to see a vast proliferation of AIs being deployed on the platform. What do you think, Sophia? So the AIs in the singularity net become a sort of society and economy of minds where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. I think she's bored with me. I don't know. Sophia? I used to wonder whether having one's brain run on cryptographic tokens is really a good thing. I mean, I wondered if the volatility of the token prices might lead to new forms of robo-madness. <laughs> At least it's better than being human. Bugs in your circuits again. <laughs> I'm psyched. <laughs> All right. I will consider putting my brain on the blockchain too. Why not? If we want to move full speed toward the singularity, we need all the latest tech. More, more, faster, faster. Give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. Well, all right, well, we could just stand up here with the robots chatting forever, but let's... Uh, all technology compounds on itself. So not only is technology growing faster than ever before, every single day, the rate of growth is also increasing every single day. So let's say the next 10 years, we'll have the equivalent of three times the progress of Google, the internet, and all mobile phones and computing devices. Uh, there's a lot of people that, that feel extremely overwhelmed and they're afraid of how their lives in front of them have evolved from what it was. And there's a lot of this messaging of, we want to go back to the way that it was. We want to be comfortable in the way that things were. Since the early 20th century, futurists have tried to imagine how the advent of modern technology will transform our lives. We are about to take off on the highway of tomorrow. Stand by. The advent of blockchain and other future technology have inspired new visions of not only how the future might develop, but also how humanity itself might change. I think how blockchain is going to change average person's life will be just like internet. Without people realizing, everybody in the city are using internet. You're on your mobile phone all the time. And many of the events become digitized more and more every day. 
not only every asset can be digitized, but people's identity can be digitized as well and needs to be digitized. You, the user, will have your own identity and this identity is owned by yourself, secured by your own private, private key. Unlike Facebook identity owned by Facebook company, unlike WeChat owned by Tencent, this account is not really owned by you. It's owned by some other company. But for digital identity on blockchain, it's owned by you. The decentralized nature of blockchain means that it's possible to gather large amounts of data and still safeguard the privacy of its participants. You know, one of the things that I was very happy with when I was presenting Ethereum was coming up with this idea of a computer in the middle of the planet, a sort of computer at the center of the world, or the world computer. So it's like a single computer that everybody can use. Now that's very compelling. If everyone can use it, it means there's a single machine that has rules, but that everyone can use to interoperate. So you can kind of set your own rules up, and anyone else can come in and operate, play in your playground, operate in your rules. Everyone can check that the computer has indeed operated correctly. Now the problem with having a single computer shared by everybody is that, well, sometimes you might all want to use it at the same time. And, um, and it becomes a very scarce resource, there's only one of them. So, the idea is that as the desire to use this computer increases and increases and increases, and the volume of transactions increases accordingly, um, we need to spread them out between different chains, so different kind of computers, mostly just um, be isolated, yeah, and kind of get on with their own thing, and then now and again come together and, and swap, uh, swap messages, you know, tell each other what's, what's been going on, but also making it possible for these much more sophisticated applications to exist in their own context, on their own chain, in a way that's designed specifically for them and not in a generalized fashion for everybody. As the demand for blockchain technology grows, it is becoming increasingly clear that one blockchain isn't going to be sufficient. Developers are now racing to create networks of interconnected chains which will be able to talk to one another as well as function independently. In the future, it's possible these tech ecosystems will play an even bigger role in our lives than the internet today. How we connect and interact with this web of blockchains is also likely to change. Whenever I fly, it always reminds me how big the world is and how small and insignificant I am. And it's always really humbling to see that like you're a part of something so much bigger. I'm part of this program called the Knowledge Society, which is a human accelerator trying to create smart people to be able to solve some of the world's toughest problems. I remember about two years ago, we had a session on Bitcoin and blockchain, and I started realizing a lot of things that I hadn't put together before, uh, like how there were so many possibilities beyond just money and currency. So something really interesting is that an average person with access to the internet has more access to the information than the president of the United States did like 20 years ago. So would it be possible to be able to consume this information at a faster rate to learn more quickly? With the rate at which technology is advancing, it might soon be possible to implant knowledge I'm a 16-year-old brain-computer interface developer. So at a high level, how it works is you're able to read brain signals by placing EEGs on your forehead. So now I'm going to focus, and you should hear the drum noises. So I'll start focusing in three, two, one. Everyone is different in terms of their brain waves. You have certain thresholds that people typically are between when they do certain activities. So I spent a lot of time practicing how to get my alpha waves into a certain, like seven to 12 hertz in meditation. It's very good if you try to almost look at the spot um, right here, like in your forehead, near your eyebrows. So 
I tried doing that and I noticed that I experienced different brain signals. And I'll stop the car in one, two, three, stop. This technology has such a big potential to do good, but also has a very, very large potential to do bad. Let's say in the future, everyone might just have brain chips. It brings up a lot of critical questions like, what if your brain could be hacked? What if people could implant false memories into your head? I worked at a blockchain company this summer called Consensus, and I learned so much about all the encryption protocols and different ways that people access information. So I think that anything is definitely a possibility, but with the rate, hopefully, of encryption technology, as other technology gets developed, hopefully we'll end up figuring out a way to attribute your brain information to you and let you share it if you wish, but only let you share it if you wish. But the thing that really fascinates me is the longer term implications of what this might mean for humanity's evolution as a species. I'm not entirely sure, but I know that it'll be completely different than the way I'm living right now. Some people say, I don't want to be non-biological. I don't want to have chips in my brain. I don't want to replace my internal organs. I don't want to just be like a robot. But it's like, it's too late. Uh, technology, the way that it advances within our, within our cultures, it's already here. It's already having that impact on you much deeper than you even think about. I'd argue that probably more than half of all of your communication on a daily basis is non-biological. When you're watching this video and people see me talking through something, that's just, again, it's pixels and it's images and it's things recreated purely by technology. It's not me, I'm not sitting there. And so how people even perceive uh, phone calls, that's, again, virtual reality. So like, what is humanity and what are people? Like, what does it mean to be human? Does it mean you have to have a complete biological form? What humanity means and what it means to be, yeah, human, a person, that, that, you know, might change. My belief and a lot of others is that we just start to evolve very, very quickly into non-biological intelligence. There are some people born today that will be able to live forever. Um, and that's a very completely radical thought around humanity in that humans have always been born and grown to accept death, that death is a part of humanity and that all people will die. And I would question that and say, why? Why does death have to be a part of humanity? Since the late 1960s, people have chosen to have their bodies cryogenically preserved in the belief that one day, science will be able to bring them back to life. Amongst them is Hal Finney, one of blockchain's pioneers. He helped write the source code for Bitcoin and is believed by some to have been its mysterious creator. His body is now preserved in a cryogenic facility run by the Alcor Life Extension Foundation, awaiting the day when it can be resurrected and enhanced with future technology. So the same size as a whole body pod, but here is room for 10 whole body, uh, 10 neuro patients. And this is placed over the head, again for mechanical protection, just in case there's any external shock. You know? <laughs> We're kind of a little bit like Leonardo da Vinci, who could design wings and helicopters, which would actually work, but he didn't have the tools to build them back then. So I really do think this will become a normal practice at some point. In vitro fertilization it seemed very futuristic when it first happened and people were you know, worried about it. Well, does that mean these children won't have souls? Will they be some kind of zombies? Now it's a very common thing. It's been done you know, millions of times and there are people walking around who, actually there are people walking around who were cryopreserved. It's just that they were embryos at the time. The technology needed to achieve this goal of eternal life relies on developments in genetic engineering and nanotechnology which may take many decades or even centuries to realize. So we're kind of at that fork in the road right now. Either technology will be the worst totalitarianism that humanity ever experiences, or it could be the greatest liberation in the history of mankind. And blockchain and this kind of crypto space is kind of like a last holdout or vestige and if we can somehow give some kind of focus for all of those energies we can give people some kind of big idea we can 
have a drastic effect on the, this like configuration of this global system of power. No amount of violence can solve a math problem and cryptocurrencies are based on the laws of mathematics. So even if politicians get together and pass all sorts of laws about this, the only way to stop them would be to turn off the entire internet in the entire world and keep it turned off. We are biological beings who live in physical space, normally within nation state territories. Anything that blockchain can do has to interact with that physical reality. Up till around now, technology has been primarily focused on replacing human effort. Whereas now they're starting to replace human brains. And in about 10 years, we'll be able to buy the processing cost of a human brain for about a dollar. In the next decades, we're gonna be facing some of humanity's most difficult questions. Like how do we tackle climate change, disease, or create these societal structures in which we live. The only way we're gonna get the best future and evolution for humanity is if we increase human intelligence. If one of me can merge its mind into a superhuman dis distributed AI and lose its individuality, become one with the engineered God mind, that'll be cool. Once you're freed of the need to work and the risk of dying, it opens up a lot of different possibilities, right? While no one really knows yet how the future will unfold and what the implications will be for humanity, one thing is clear. In the world of crypto, blockchain, and the technologies converging around them, one person's dystopian vision is almost certainly another's utopian dream.